Bine, v-am găsit la o ediție specială Calea de Văruri și Viața. După cum v-am obișnuit de câteva luni de zile, lunar, pe spațiu acestei emisiuni, difuzăm pentru dumneavoastră o emisiune specială sub genericul Raport European. Este o emisiune tip de zbatere pe care colegii noștri de la studioul de la canalul de televiziune în limba engleză Revolution TV o realizează în Bruxelles, în incinta Parlamentului European. Anul acesta, această serie de, de emisiuni a fost făcută în parteneriat cu lideri ai organizației European College for Israel, aici, cum îi spunem noi, prieteni ai noștri, suntem și noi de, de multe ori în, în legătură cu ei, participăm la evenimente organizate de ei. Deci, cei colegii noștri de la European College for Israel uh, și, și de data aceasta, prin, prin uh, directorul lor, fondator Thomas Sandel, uh, este parte din această emisiune, chiar dacă are o contribuție prin Skype, uh, um, Ideea pe care el o aduce în, în discuție în emisiunea aceasta este uh, legată de ONU și faptul că ONU a recunoscut, de exemplu, în decurând, spre, spre uimirea și spre surpriza noastră, sărbătoarea Iom Kipur și uh, alte comentarii despre evenimentul Tashlik uh, de la ONU. Invitatul în platou este jurnalistul James Marlow, care vorbește despre aceste sărbători evrești Iom Kipur și Rosh Hashanah. Uh, E interesant, de fiecare dată sperăm că prin această emisiune să aducem o, o nuanță mai proaspătă, o dimensiune a ceea ce Dumnezeu începe să facă și la nivelul Parlamentului European în ceea ce privește uh, poporul evreu, în ceea ce privește uh, oarecum deschiderea uh, pentru unii, pentru alții provocarea cel puțin a uh, Domnului pentru problematica poporului Israel. Așadar, o ediție special raport european pe spațiul emisiunii care adevăr și viața din această seară. Hello and uh, welcome to the European Report. Uh, here we are in our studios in uh, London as uh, Thomas Sandel from uh, the European Coalition for Israel is doing very important work at uh, the UN uh, in terms of giving Israel a voice in the United Nations, which is very needed. So in today's program, I'm joined by James Marlowe, who is a journalist and also a Middle East analyst. Uh, James, it's a real pleasure to have you on the European uh, Report. It's a shame that we're not here in, uh, in Brussels or in Brussels, actually, in the European Parliament doing this program today. But I prefer Israel. That would be better. Sunshine there, blue skies. Ab absolutely, I couldn't agree more. But um, for uh, our, our viewers, can you share something about uh, your background? Uh, you're, you're, auth you're a practicing Jewish person, <laughs> which is great. And uh, you know, you are, uh, you've worked in media and in TV and radio for many years and also very much been involved with um, bringing in a greater understanding to Israel's situation that Israel faces in the Middle East today. You've said everything that I was going to say. I don't need to say anything. It's interesting you were just going to say the word orthodox Jew and then change it to practicing Jew. I think practicing sounds better because uh, orthodox perhaps sounds a little bit odd. But uh, to maybe pick up on that point as well, a Jewish person who observes traditional Jewish law. So that means keeping the Shabbat, keeping the festivals. We are at the eve of the 10 days of repentance, the high holy days, starting with the Jewish New Year and ending with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, 10 days later, and then five days after that is into another Jewish festival. So I'm uh, observant of those and live within a Jewish community. Yet yeah, come from a media broadcasting background, bit of television, bit of radio, bit of writing in the press, delivering some courses and classes, media trainer, communications trainer, and that's probably enough to say at the moment. Fantastic, so uh, well, let, let's start uh, today's program pretty much because uh, Thomas Sandow, who I do the program with and uh, is the founder and director of the European Coalition for Israel, um, does a lot of work within the United Nations and uh, particularly as we are building and moving towards the opening of the uh, U United Nations session or what is known as the General Assembly where the representatives from world governments around the world meet in New York to discuss the issues facing the world at the UN. Um, uh, in, in your view, how important is the UN in terms of bringing peace and giving representation to the nations of the world? 
initially when it was set up, the United Nations was essential. It was coming together of all the nations of the world in order to prevent another disaster, another world war. And over the years, it has managed to make contributional um, uh, inputs into problems within countries around the world, namely in Africa and Asia, uh, contributing to a UN force and, and helping very much in refugees. But since that time, sadly, I think it's fair to say that it has been hijacked by certain countries within the UN governing board that specifically want to follow their agenda. For example, we have 22 Arab votes who always vote with each other you have 57 Islamic votes that always vote each other, with each other, and they manage to control that agenda. When it comes to resolutions specifically against Israel, you've got those countries that link up with countries in South America, within Africa, within Asia, who specifically need to vote with the Islamic votes not just because they believe entirely in their outlook, but because they need to be concerned about economic and political considerations, business, trading, etc., and they will always vote with them. And as a result, I think it's fair to say that the United Nations has been hijacked, and it's also allegedly ridiculed and riddled with corruption. There is so much money which is changing hands in certain areas when that money should not be there in the United Nations headquarters in New York, but it should be spread out in the various places where they've got camps and UN camps specifically designed for refugees and for people. And it's not doing that. In some cases, it's going into the pockets of people that should not be having that money. And that's why, unfortunately today, the United Nations has a great many amount of question marks around its two initials, UN. And uh, we now have uh, Thomas Sandow, the founder and the director of the European Coalition for Israel, uh, joining us by Skype from uh, New York. Hello, Thomas, and uh, how are you? Hello, Simon. I'm very, very well today, and, and in a few moments you, I will explain why. Uh, you've got some um, I incredible news to uh, share with us, uh, uh, and this is the incredible work that uh, you've been doing for is it a couple of years now and trying to get the United Nations to recognize Yom Kippur uh, as an official uh, UN holiday. Yeah, that, that is correct. We, we are looking, uh, say, two years back in, in time where this process started, and, and we realized that um, the Jewish people were not giving a, a fair treatment at the UN. We, well, that is no news, but on one very fundamental level, that was also the case that Yom Kippur, being the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, uh, was a normal working day at the UN, uh, meaning in particular that when the UN General Assembly would work for, it would meet for a high-level debate, Israel could not participate. And, and we felt this was uh, completely wrong, and we raised this issue. We started a campaign together with the Israeli mission at the, at the UN. And um, uh, just a few months ago, there was the first recognition ever to say, in a resolution to say that uh, uh, mentioning Yom Kippur being the most holy day in the Jewish calendar and saying that there should be no UN activities on that particular day. Um, what we have not seen yet is the full recognition of um, Yom, Kipp Yom Kippur as a UN holiday, which is uh, clearly more, more complicated and, and costly. But uh, what, what happened last night, of course, was a major, major uh, breakthrough and uh, uh, step in that direction. Uh, uh, and Thomas, can you share with us uh, what happened last night? Because you know, I've got here in front of me uh, an article from the Times of Israel and uh, there's Ban Ki-moon, the leader of the United Nations, Ron Prosser, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, and uh, our good friend as well, um, Gregory uh, Lafayette in the background. Yes, correct. And, and even if you look uh, more closely at, at that picture, you will also see our chairman, Rudolf Geige, uh, in the background. And uh, there are more pictures. Uh, like that. So what happened uh, last night at the Rose Garden outside the United Nations that for the first time in the history, in the 70 year history of the United Nations, uh, Yom Kippur was, was recognized. There was an event which, which most Jew well, Jewish people will be familiar with, the Tasli, which, which means uh, uh, it's, it's a, it, in Hebrew it's tossing, tossing away of sins. Uh, 
um, in order to start the new year on a, on a clean uh, clean slate. And um, we had this event at the UN, uh, some 100, 150 people in attendance, uh, speeches by Ambassador Prosor, by, by Gregory Lafitte, myself, and, and um, uh, the Chief Rabbi Arthur Schneier of the Parkis Synagogue, and um, then also actually unannounced uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, showed up and, and um, attended this meeting and also took part in this uh, ceremony of Taslik, which means uh, uh, tossing uh, small uh, you know, uh, pieces of bread into the East River as a symbol of uh, tossing away our sins. And as Ambassador Proso said, this is symbolically, of course, for the United Nations to, to start this new 70th um, uh, session of the UN General Assembly by, by um, uh, getting rid of the sins of the past and try to, to start on, uh, on, um, on a clean sheet of paper, so to speak. So, um, as, as you would have heard, um, it was Rabbi Arthur Schneier, who is a Holocaust survivor, he is close to, he is 85 years old, and he said, well, this has been my prayer uh, all these years, that there could be such an event here at the UN. And uh, so, in the Jewish community, it was a great, enormous encouragement to see that, uh, that also the Jewish holidays would be properly recognized at the UN that the Ban Ki-moon would, would come and pray, uh, pay tribute to, uh, to, to this Jewish custom and to the Jewish people. So um, um, it, it was an awesome, awesome night, let's just put it that way. Fantastic. And also the uh, 21st of September also marked um, the UN's International Day of Peace. Do you think Correct. there's a connection between this International Day of Peace and uh, the UN finally recognizing Yom Kippur as a, as a holiday? Well, I think there is a connection, and this is something that Gregory Lafitte spoke in his, uh, mentioned in his speech. There is a clear uh, connection with the Jewish uh, vision of world peace uh, expressed, uh, among other places, in Isaiah 2, and the creation of the United Nations. And we often, time and time again, we uh, remind UN officials about this, that uh, you have this place, the Isaiah Wall, uh, just right across from the UN headquarters, where it is uh, quoting Isaiah 2 of uh, this time when uh, swords will be turned into plowshares. And we remind uh, these politicians, diplomats, and UN officials that, listen, this is a Jewish vision. It's from the Jewish Bible where this whole idea and vision of world peace came from. And that was also our main message in what we were saying, to say that, you know, we need to honor the Jewish people. We need to, to uh, pay tribute to everything that they have contributed to, to the international community, to the creation of the UN, and to the notion of world peace. And I think what happened last night really was that by, by Ban Ki-moon uh, paying honor to, to this, um, uh, attending the event and paying honor to the Jewish people, it was really, and th that is unique for us, that Israel as a nation, the Jewish people uh, as a people group, were honored by the nations that came. And this is very rare, as, as you know, at the UN, but it was so powerful to be there and to be there as non-Jews and be able to speak and to be able to um, uh, mention these things and say that, you know, we, we come from Europe, we know our past, we know what went wrong in the past. And it actually started with uh, us not honoring the Jewish people uh, the way we should. And as we said so many times, we just don't simply want to tolerate the Jewish people, but, but celebrate uh, Israel and the Jewish people. And that's exactly what we did last night in the good company of the Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon and, and ambassadors and diplomats from some uh, uh, 50 uh, countries, I would think. Uh, and how, what was the uh, response of uh, Israel's ambassador to the UN, Ron Prosser? Because he, he's quite a character and uh, he's achieved so much in his career in the Israeli foreign ministry. What was it like for him to, to really go out recognizing that the UN has finally seen that uh, Yom Kippur should be an official holiday? Yeah, I think uh, our friend Ambassador Prosser was uh, very moved in his speech. It was a short speech, but a very powerful speech. 
uh, acknowledging this fact that, uh, that uh, let's hope that this is the first step in a direction where Israel would be treated like any other uh, UN member state. Israel doesn't need any privileges, but, but they just need to be uh, treated in a fair way. And, and um, uh, you know, for, for um, Ambassador Prosor, who will leave the United Nations, as you know, in just a few weeks and be replaced by, uh, by a new ambassador, uh, I think this was the best possible uh, farewell party that, that could have taken place. In my speech, I, um, I um, took a moment to pay tribute to Ambassador Prosor and his uh, uh, work at the United Nations, which I believe has been very successful. He's been a very wonderful representative of the State of Israel, and um, he is, is worth all, all the honor than, that, uh, that he can get. I, I can agree more with you. And uh, finally, Thomas, um, what's next for ECI? What's the next campaign? What's your next uh, focus? Or are you going to continue trying to lobby uh, for Yom Kippur to be completely recognized by the, uh, by the United Nations in actually having a, a national holiday or an international holiday for yeah. Yom Kippur? Obviously, Simon, as I understand, there are so many challenges uh, facing the Jewish people, facing Israel as a state. Um, we need to remain vigilant when it comes to the rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, but we also need this positive approach that we call cultural diplomacy. Uh, this was, of course, co-hosted by our initiative, uh, Forum for uh, Cultural Diplomacy, where we uh, approach the nations in a slightly different way. Instead of blaming them for what they are doing wrong, we're just focusing on all these wonderful things that the um, Judeo-Christian uh, heritage, the, the Jewish roots have produced in, in our cultures, in our countries, in our civilizations. Most people take them for granted. But I think the uniqueness also of um, last evening was the fact that we pointed out these things that, that people take for granted, but they need to be reminded of them, that we have so many things to, to thank the Jewish people for, uh, and um, I, I think in, in that respect, last evening was such a wonderful exception to, to what usually goes on on the UN level, that nations from so many, uh, ambassadors from so many nations would come together uh, for once to, to give honor to the Jewish people, to Israel, and to, to celebrate Israel in this uh, very special way. Uh, Thomas, I want to thank you so much uh, for sharing your incredible uh, news breaking uh, news with us um, from the United Nations and particularly in New York. Thank you. <laughs> and also by doing that symbolically, we think of those who do not have daily bread. We think of those who don't have daily water. And we thank God for the blessing. Not only that we have it food, that we're able to enjoy it, bless it, take it for granted, to be able to eat, to be able to see, to be able to hear, bless it. But who's not down and now you're here now alone? You've been seeing that on the news. Amen. Try going there, over there with me. And since so all of us were eating sherry, we shared the fish. <laughs> so, uh, Rabbi Schneier, Secretary General, Ambassador Professor, symbolically a small crumb. Wait, uh, also believe in a clean planet, so it's a very small crumb. <laughs> Rabbi Schneier, Thomas and Gregory from ECI, distinguished guests, ambassadors, friends, 
I'm sure that uh, some of you are wondering and may even feel a bit concerned why the Israeli ambassadors brought you to the edge of the East River this evening. Don't be nervous. I promise you, I haven't found, you haven't found yourself in a new episode of The Sopranos. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last week the Jewish people celebrated the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, which marks in the Jewish tradition the beginning of the new year in the Hebrew calendar and the start of the holiday season. It is a time of reflection and an opportunity to consider the challenges of the past and lay out the goals and aspirations of the future. As part of the holiday celebration, we're here today to participate in a unique tradition, tashlich, which really literally means to toss, tossing. It's an opportunity to symbolically cast off the sins of the past and let the flowing water carry away the shortcomings of the previous year. I know many New Yorkers are always trying the latest fat diet or health cleanse, so you can think of the shlich as a kind of spiritual detox. As many of you know, I'm about to conclude my tenure as Israel's ambassador to the UN. As my time in New York comes to a close, I've started to reflect, thank you, on the past four years, and all we have worked together all of us here to try and achieve. I think of all the friends and partners who made these achievements possibly and possible. Many of you are here with us tonight and I want to say thank you. As we mark 70 years since the founding of the United Nations, this is also an opportunity to reflect on the objectives of this institution, where it has fallen short and where we have not done enough to alleviate human suffering. Seventy years on, it is time for voices of reason, of tolerance and moderation to reclaim the public space. It is time for the UN to re-establish its rightful role as a bastion of freedom and as a temple of peace it was really established to be. I want to conclude my thanking to all of you and many people of faith and goodwill around the globe because standing here together in this beautiful garden here in the United Nations, sometimes we don't appreciate it enough, is really reflecting upon the world we live in and the future that we want for our children and grandchildren. And on this day, as the UN marks the International Day of Peace. Let us cast off hatred and apathy so that together we can make the world a better place. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for coming and sharing this evening with us. Todaraba. James, uh, you know, the important is something uh, it's a really big achievement uh, and that is to getting the united nations to recognize the jewish holiday of yom kippur known as the day of atonement which is the holiest day in the jewish calendar uh, can you tell us the meaning and significance of yom kippur because it's about it's about forgiveness and it's about forgiving others and isn't it about time that the whole united nations could actually learn something about this great jewish festival known as uh, yom kippur I'm not sure it's a festival as such. Yom yes. Kippur is the 10th of 10 days. So we're just coming into Rosh Hashanah, which is known as uh, the Jewish New Year. Rosh, the head, Shana, the year. Um, it starts Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday. A little bit of a, perhaps a time um, elsewhere that we would discuss why it's two days. It's something to do with the calendar. Um, the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day, they're all specific, known as 10 days of repentance. And the climax is actually the 10th day, which is, of course is Yom Kippur. How you differentiate between the two is Rosh Hashanah is something that the former chief rabbi, actually the one before that, Rabbi Jakobowicz, Zetzal said, and he focused on the idea that Rosh Hashanah the Jewish New Year is something that you look forward to. In other words, because you come to the end of your year, 
And it's different for the Christian year. In Christian, the Christianity, there's a great deal of celebration and parties and drinking and, and going down to, uh, to see Big Ben and the fireworks and things like that to a certain degree. The Jewish New Year is actually purely a very spiritual time. And it is involved in food and things like that. But it's actually you're restricted, just like the Jewish Sabbath. So very simply, I'm not sure if we've just got one minute here. Okay, just over one minute. Um, very simply, the Jewish New Year starts with Rosh Hashanah, and Rosh Hashanah is literally looking towards how you wish to change your life for the future. In other words, what needs retweeting? retweaking rather, what needs recalibrating? Where am I in my spiritual life? Where am I in my personal life? Where am I in my professional life? What about my health? Do I need to work on myself? These are things that I need to make changes in my life. When you get to Yom Kippur on the 10th day, it's literally about now I know where I'm going in life. That's my vision, that's my goal, that's my objective. Now, in order for me to achieve my objective, I now have to put right what we did beforehand as well, all the sins and all the problems and all the mistakes that I made as well, and therefore look above, look to heaven and ask for forgiveness. Making the vision is really important because if you don't know where you're going in life, then any road is going to take you there, but it might take a long time. Fantastic. So we're down to the uh, two minutes uh, left of the, of the program, James. Um, so I have to ask you, um, this is such an incredible uh, an occasion to be in Israel for Yom Kippur when virtually everyone just stops what they're doing. There's no cars on the streets and it's a time to reflect and pause and think about about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Yeah, Yom Kippur is known as the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Of course, people know it from the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And although the majority of Jewish people around the world, majority being 51% or more, are probably not observant of the Shabbat. In other words, refraining from driving and watching television and uh, cooking and doing all the things that you would do normally on a Saturday. Observant Jews don't do those things. They have it prepared beforehand as well. Uh, but Yom Kippur is all of those laws. So one doesn't drive and one doesn't uh, go to the beach and one doesn't, uh, in fact, on the contrary, one doesn't eat or drink and you're fasting for about 26 hours. And it's all about the idea of forgiveness, which is very, very important in Yom Kippur. The majority of Jews around the world do observe this. Whether they go to synagogue or not, that's something else. But they do fast. And fasting means, just to be clear, no food, no water, and we actually, we don't even wear shoes. We wear plimsolls and things like that. So it is something that it's a time of reflection and asking for forgiveness. Uh, James, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's A European Report. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure to be here and happy to speak about the Jewish holidays in the future. Fantastic. And um, I just want to thank you all for watching today's uh, European Report. Maybe the United Nations could learn something or two about uh, forgiveness and certainly how nations interact. So thank you for watching today's European Report. Mm -hmm.